have a really interesting mix of people here talking about bridging between post high school education and the workforce. My name is Judy Olian. I am the Dean of UCLA Anderson School of Management. And I'm going to ask each person to introduce themselves. Okay, this isn't working. Uh, I'm going to ask each person to introduce themselves via a question. And that is, each of you identified a particular gap in the marketplace that isn't being served educationally. And I want you to introduce yourself, identify that niche that you identified, and how you, your venture is reducing uh, or addressing uniquely that gap in the marketplace. So Candice, let's start with you. Sure. Well, uh, let's see. Get that on. Um, I remember when uh, Jake started GA and he said, I'm after the lost and lonelies, the kids in their 20s and 30s that have no idea what they're going to do and what's next. And I have a bunch of those in my family as my kids. But I also have a batch in college. And I realized how great it would be if during college, during community college or college or sometime during that very extended period, um, young people could really figure out what they want to do and get ready to go do it. And it turned out around the world that was something that would super helpful. So we really focus on young people, uh, 18 to let's say some adult learners in community colleges. We work with colleges, universities, um, and foundations and governments. So we, in a way, help uh, the big institutions try to move into this world, whereas I, uh, some of my colleagues here just kind of broke with it and said, to hell with it, let's just go start the new world. Um, I think they're both really interesting ways to go. So we help young people actually get the hard skills, soft skills, and employers are saying they need not so much vocationally, but just you know understanding how to work in teams, understanding how to deal with bosses, understanding what they want to do for a living, understanding how to contribute, understanding how to have the proper level of confidence and humility, understanding math, understanding uh, finance, just the basic stuff that globally turns out to be what every employer is saying is the problem right now. It's just that balance that makes a good day one employee. So I'll, I'll come back. I'll come back to you and ask yeah. a bit more specifics. Sure. So let's go to you, Jacqueline, Great. from ASU. Hi, I'm Jacqueline Smith. I'm an assistant VP for university initiatives at ASU. And what that means is I run a startup lab that launches new ideas within the university. So when President Crow joined ASU, uh, he was previously at Columbia University, and he said that one of his frustrations is that the university had to say no too frequently, because new ideas require bandwidth and capacity to vet and explore, and so he wanted to create a startup lab unit that was uh, positioned to say yes. And so uh, we're working on a variety of design challenges uh, relevant to this uh, panel. About a year ago, a foundation based in New York, the Markle Foundation, came to us and said that they wanted to explore the middle skill landscape and the middle skill economy. So they wanted to start helping the millions of Americans who have a high school diploma and are looking to determine how to upskill and how to navigate the variety of educational pathways, certificates, credentials, many things we talked about today, help them make the decision to either pursue one of those certificates, assist to an associate's Want to go ahead and get that bachelor's. And so a year ago, the question was really, how do we help more middle skill uh, learners and workers upskill? And now that we've been working with the Markle Foundation, LinkedIn, edX, and a variety of workforce oh, development uh, partners uh, over the past year together, uh, we've decided that um, our question now is really, how do we make the educational landscape more transparent and more accessible? Thanks. Jim, Galvanize. Yes, hi, good afternoon. My name is uh, Jim Dieters. I'm the founding CEO of Galvanize. Um, I spent my entire career working on building tech companies, software companies, and in the talent development place. Um, as I'd like to say, I've, I've hired more than a, is it not on? Am I allowed now? Oh, it's not on. Hello, there we go. There I've hired go. more than a thousand job engineers in, in my career, and I haven't looked at a resume in 15 years. Um, when it comes to the skills-based economy we've moved to, and for many folks that want to have the uh, access to an upwardly mobile, mobile path, that path in the modern age is actually a, 
uh, digital skill set, whether that be software engineering or data scientists, or the opportunity and uh, capability of building their own company as an entrepreneur. Um, after selling my last company um, to Avnet, actually, I had this crazy idea of building a 21st century skills-based place where anybody with ambition and aptitude would have the opportunity to become a software engineer, a data scientist, or entrepreneur. And we run the fastest growing, one of the largest boot camps in the world, and our flagship program is a six-month web development program where we have 97% uh, placement and our average salary is just under $80,000. Okay, Jacqueline. Oh, Rachel, Rachel, sorry. Rachel. Hi, uh, I'm Rachel Romer Carlson. I'm the co founder and CEO of Guild Education. Um, with Guild, you know, we often all talk about college to career, and what we're actually serving is the cycle the other way, which is the 40 million uh, young adults in the US who are active in the workforce but have not yet completed a higher ed credential and have ambitions to do so. And so we work with working adults, most of whom are in low wage economy, some are in low middle, uh, to find the right credential. And so we think about job to credential to career. And that credential may include a class, it may include a program, or it may include a college degree. And we work with each student to find the right pathway with them um, and a consortium of providers, including non-traditional as well as colleges and universities, to help align those students with the right opportunity. And that work came out of uh, work that our team has done in the community college sector, as well as with a variety of other student populations who are struggling to find the right path in the world that we often talk about today in terms of elite credentials and elite colleges, and instead thinking about what they need now that they're already in the workforce and have in some ways been left behind by the traditional pathways to higher ed. So I, I want to just dig one, one more level in terms of what your specific companies or programs are doing to reduce that friction in the marketplace, the misalignment between the demand and the supply. So starting with you, Rachel and Guild, what is it that specifically your company is doing that brings those two sides closer? Sure, so. Uh, and what's unique about it? Sure. Um, much of our founding work was in the community college space where we found that 80% of community college students were working more than 30 hours a week. But we had no information about what they were doing. It, the programs they were taking were often entirely misaligned with their aspirations and what they did in their job. And we weren't connecting the two. And so we think about it from a demand-driven approach. Um, so we start by working with employers and actually connect with our students through their employers. And those are often fast casuals, those are restaurants, those are hotels like the one we're in today, manu advanced manufacturing, all the skilled labor that we all know of. And we work with them to figure out how can we connect those students towards upward mobility, towards family sustaining wages and middle class careers. Um, so for us it's been about starting at the employer rather than starting at the community college. So Jim, you have a rather unique co-location model here. So talk about that as a reducing friction approach. Yeah, literally one of the biggest challenges we've, we've always seen is um, in the traditional era um, that most of us came of employment age to, we went away to this uh, beautiful, uh, clean ivory tower environment of learning, and then we separated industry over here. And um, l one of the crazy ideas was how to literally and physically bring them into the same environment. So if you walk into our 75,000 square foot campus at First and Howard in South of Market, um, you will literally see companies, both big and small, whether you're a Fortune 500 like IBM or Allstate, or you're a two-person startup or a 20-person startup, all working in the same environment. And so what the idea was is that working and learning should be synonymous and that the industry literally being in the same environment become pedagogically integrated into a learning experience by connecting them with mentors. And, and those both happen sort of serendipitously because they're in the same container, but also concertedly by driving mentors and, and entrepreneurs in terms of where people's intention are. If they want to be empowered to build their own company, they can be aligning themselves with uh, entrepreneurs and mentors in the area, whether it be venture capitalists on campus or other CEOs of startups, or they can be sitting with a distinguished engineer from IBM on their Watson machine learning if they're a data scientist uh, st uh, student. And so if you walk into that campus on any one day, there'll be about 800 different people there, and you can't tell who's that from Google Ventures, who's a data science student, who's an IBM executive, or who's this curious from industry who walked into our cafe in this great big I bet you could pot. tell the IBM executive. Uh, sometimes, you know, they, the Blue Blazer does still exist. <laughs> yeah. 
Okay, Jack, <laughs> Jacqueline, th th that same question about reducing friction. Sure, so really what I think uh, is special about even that a university is included uh, in this kind of panel um, is that ASU is really committed to making sure that there are more on-ramps to education. I was reflecting on Sal Khan's comments this afternoon about inverting the pyramid so that we have more of uh, the creative class engineers um, at the what used to be the base but really flipped about. So we need more individuals who are what President Crow would call our master adaptive learners who are ready to learn anything over the course of their lifetime. And so we're participating in the project with the Markle Foundation which is called Rework America Skillful because we see skillful as an on-ramp. We see galvanized boot camps as an on-ramp to education. And we're really proud to participate because uh, for those who want to continue to get a bachelor's degree, um, we want to make sure that the on-ramps that are created are then stackable credentials that can allow someone, should they want to pursue, to pursue that bachelor's degree uh, moving forward. Because uh, also for the comments of um, during the lunch period as well, um, this idea that we need to move away from thinking about our learning taking place up until the age of 25 and really move more towards this lifelong learning approach. Um, that our first step in moving towards this lifelong learning approach is thinking about and diversifying again those on ramps to education. And so uh, that's why we've jumped on board with We Work America Skillful, but that's also why we work uh, with other partners like those represented on the stage today to think about ways to um, make those on ramps um, more accessible to a higher diversity of the population. And, and my guess is that most of the major universities that we all know the names of, are increasingly offering boot camps for a variety of populations, those returning, those who've never been to the university, or those who are their current students. Mm -hmm. Candice, sure. producing friction. Well, uh, first of all, I think that um, things like what Jim is doing really responded to a need to get kids ready for a new kind of job that just didn't exist and therefore really couldn't be taught in university and wasn't appropriate to teach. But that leaves you know, a lot of other, of the 250 million college students, that leaves most of them that will still go into hospitality and sales and white collar jobs that have been around, but colleges are still not preparing them for the way they're run today. And I think that is really the job that we took on. And then we have the challenge, do we go and just get student by student and a consumer model? But what we found is because this problem was so prevalent in every country we looked at, in Singapore, in uh, China now, in India, only in the last couple years, um, in East Africa with a really fast growth rate, um, we found this problem that college graduates were actually not ready to work and the employers were saying the same things in every one of those countries, which is interesting because they're all very different countries. So we felt that the, the most leveraged way for us to work was we built our program on a base of technology, use coaching, use competency scoring, which I know the last panel talked a lot about. Um, and create a bridge, really, for those students to build these competencies, have a way to communicate them out to employers, and then work on some very large contracts. We awarded about a $40 million contract last summer. Um, we're doing 25,000 students at the University of Marco area in Uganda. So we found that we can work pretty effectively at a highly scaled uh, level now because of the coaching model that allows it still to be quite intimate and in getting the students ready to work. So I'll ask uh, two questions, and I'm going to ask the panel to respond relatively quickly because I see the clock ticking. Uh, one is, how do you get funded? I'm, I'm a business school dean, so we think about that. And the other is, how uh, do you use technology, especially in the models that you really want to scale? So Jim, why don't you start? In terms of money and technology, money for Galvanize or money for the students for Galvanize? No, how do you? What's your business model? Oh, uh, we collect tuition. You know, students uh, <laughs> are, are. We have four programs right now. We run our flagship program is a six-month uh, web development program. It's twenty thousand dollars. We run a twelve-week data science immersive. That's seventeen thousand dollars. We run a deliberate derivative of that. 12-week uh, immersive in data engineering, and we actually run a fully accredited 12-month, uh, uh, full, fully uh, full-year master's in data science in cooperation with the University of New Haven, which is $48,000. So we we run a you know broad swath of, of of 
you know, tuition driven uh, dollars. And that's where, you know, we're able to um, build a 21st century faculty that's industry aligned. But our revenue, revenue base is 70% uh, tuition driven. So I was going to ask, because I also know that you have a real estate play as part of your, your model. So 70% is tuition based and it's a for profit uh, venture. Yep. What, ab what about technology? Uh, so technology. So uh, the, the real estate is um, your school has real estate, right? Any any twenty any school had built a physical infrastructure where humans the humans can be part of that learning experience. We break down the technology enabled uh, uh, part of our business in really three categories. We've written our own custom LMS where we build a flexible blended learning model. We really believe the the instruction should be a facilitator. Um, and that we built our own LMS where we manage our curriculum. And part of the business model innovation is to allow a rotation pod of allowing faculty to be industry current, write curriculum, and rotate through a cycle where anybody who's trying to scale this type of model has to keep pace with the change of industry and allow for faculty to have time to redevelop and have professional time. As our faculty say, they don't want to spar, they actually want to get in the ring and fight. Um, the uh, next piece of technology is um, our competency-based assessment platform that's playing matchmaking between our students and employers. So we run our students through our LMS. We're managing 130 competencies across one of our programs where we can say exactly what ma level of mastery someone is on HTML5, on MongoDB, on Java, on JavaScript, on Node. And then we actually collect all these attributes and we match make those with attributes from our employers and we can, we can predict who is the best talent match between our employer partners and our actual students. And last but not least where we tech enabled this is where on, our online component is we too believe that the cycle for learning, we're able to give people their first opportunity to a great company, but believe ultimately industry and the corporations should finance the continuous learning cycle. And we're building out our online capabilities where once we place a junior engineer in a company, maybe their next track is become a senior DevOps engineer and they can start that next cycle online and then visit a retail location in which we have a, a physical real estate campus where they can come and meet and have mentorship from faculty and other peers learning the same uh, technology. Rachel, the business model and the role of technology. Sure. So on the business model, uh, it, it's our goal to keep the cost as low as possible for our students since many of them are earning 8 to $16 an hour and have somewhere around $800 in their checking and savings account total. So for us, uh, we straddle the traditional higher ed and the non-traditional. Um, our students in degree pathways have access to Pell Grants, and many of them are Pell eligible, which is a helpful mechanism. Um, but we have had a lot of interest from employers to provide additional soft skills and programs that aren't in the traditional line of higher ed, in which case the employer is actually the payer, um, paying for upskilling opportunities for their employees, or programs that are designed simply to give their employees a benefit. The way that healthcare is a benefit, we think of education as a benefit that they can provide their low wage employees as well. Um, on the technology piece, everything we teach is online. Uh, we didn't know that we would land there, but our users are incredibly busy working adults. Many of them have one and a half to two jobs, sometimes three. Uh, and with the help of a mobile platform and a custom CRM that we use, uh, we track all of our student data across any program uh, or degree that they do, and many of them move from one to the other as they move throughout their career. And our coaches, which is really the backbone of our entire system, um, are in touch with our students on a weekly basis using that CRM and an LMS that allows us to teach custom content. And Candice? Um, so our business model basically is that we uh, do large contracts with um, large university systems and with foundations and governments around the world. Sometimes in collaboration, we launched a program for 20,000 young Saudi women that was run through a large vocational school but paid for by the government. In Uganda, it's a combination of the, 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 the head of the government and the university together. I think one of the big breakthroughs for us is we started with co-located boot camps and then really were interested in how we could take our level of impact to scale and found that um, because we had a technology platform and blended learning and a remote coaching model, we were able to actually price it for universities in such a way that they could cover it with their existing budgets. And that's really important in this whole evolution. We have a big program with uh, ASU and we're actually a big part of the Marco Foundation uh, where a lot of the content that edX has put out for that. But we found ways, I think it's really important in our view, if you're gonna work with, if you're gonna work with universities, you gotta find their budgets that exist today and really find a way to make the model work within that instead of completely relying on new budgets to be created. 
um, unless you want your grandchildren to be still at this business. <laughs> so I think we've been really excited to be able to use uh, both coaching and, and, and technology and train the trainer models and a bunch of other ways of bringing this to large uh, university populations in an affordable way. So you use some of the university personnel on site? Yes, that's one choice they have. They also have, we have remote coaching models, but what that does is if, if a boot camp is one to 20, let's say, um, these train the trainer models allow you to have a lot of high personal touch, but one, one of our coaches to say 800 students, so it dramatically changes um, the economics, but it actually, um, the student still has a lot of mentoring and coaching available to them. So let me ask the next question, and I'll start with you, Jacqueline, because you come from a, a more traditional higher ed um, environment. Y you know, if, if we think about the landscape of what post high school education is in this country today, um, actually, from a vocational ed standpoint, the OECD estimates, I just read a report over the last couple of weeks that by 2018, a third of the jobs in the U.S. will require some <coughs> kind of vocational ed. And in the U.S., only 12% have a vocational ed degree. So we, we tend to be, in a sense, overskilling and not necessarily matching to the kinds of jobs that exist or will exist in our economy. So I, I'm asking you each to dream here, and especially since you come from a different sector, uh, what, what do you think the master plan should be in terms of the slices of post high school education in this country? And you can think short term, you can think longer term. And Jacqueline, why don't I start with you? Sure, and also bouncing back to your previous question, um, I won't give a lecture on how a university is funded in public finance, but I did want to comment on the second part, which was how we use technology to scale. And it's relevant to the Rework America Skillful uh, project because when the Markle Foundation was looking for places to launch their effort, uh, they started in the state of Colorado and then they also wanted to start in a metro area. And so they came to Phoenix uh, for two main reasons. One, we have a growing number of middle skill jobs, primarily in IT and advanced manufacturing, and so they knew this would be a good hotbed to test this effort. Um, and two, because ASU is a proven track record of using technology to scale. And um, although we are a university, I would say that there's nothing about us that's really Really traditional and that's something that Michael Crow has really uh, worked to change. Uh, one effort that we've launched in the past year is called the Global Freshman Academy and so we have 15,000 students who are taking courses that you need for your freshman year of a bachelor's degree like human origins uh, or a math, a math course or English and uh, they can take that completely for free and if they pass that class, then at the end of that experience, then they can pay to convert that to credit. So it's a way to minimize the risk to the student to decide to enroll on an educational pathway. Again, it's another one of those new kinds of on-ramps to education to see if more people will, will give it a shot. Um, and I mentioned that here to your most recent question about um, what we re really need in a post-secondary landscape. Uh, because I think we actually need to stop thinking about our education system as a before, before secondary, secondary and post-secondary landscape. We actually need you to start thinking of it as a learning ecosystem. And if we're truly going to have a world in which we don't just learn until age 25 and we are lifelong learners, then I would say, you know, if I could wave a magic wand, perhaps in the eighth grade, I'm not sure exactly the, the pivot point, um, I would actually work on letting students know about uh, how they're now, on, they're on an educational journey. They began that educational journey uh, when they were in, when, in kindergarten. Um, and they are, now have a variety of choices that they can start making in high school that will set them up success, for success over the course of their lifetime. So we've been talking a lot, I've been hearing in various sessions about various mindset shifts that we need to have. And I think a major one that we need to have is not looking to disrupt lifelong learning starting at age 25 but stepping that back, changing the way we talk about what it is to have an educational pathway. So that way, when we are creating these on-ramps that I'm speaking of now, 
It's not an abrupt turnoff, if you will. It is a smooth on-ramp that has begun uh, early on in that person's uh, lifetime. And I think that even if there are some diversions along the way and jobs are pursued, uh, and then an individual in their 30s or 40s is looking to take another on-ramp, um, it will be less daunting to make that choice because these options have been um, made more transparent early on. You know, I really did on that. I mean, my what I saw when we got into this is that we're all starting way too late, and um, really, we should be starting so much earlier in the school in school, and giving kids a sense of how math ties to interesting things to do, how science ties to interesting things to do, how all of it ties to things to go do in the world, and I th because I think what I've gotten, especially from our kind of elite boot camp days, which were our roots. Um, so many well-educated kids who have no idea what kind of possibilities are out there for them. I mean, now I think most kids paying any attention have figured out the coding is out there. But there are still hundreds. I actually talked to one of the top women who does kind of very high-end consulting of, of kids at like top schools, and she said literally most of her clients can name, these young college kids can name 12 professions. And she said there's 2,000, you know, today, and it's growing and changing all the time. So. There's just this uh, almost like you know blinders about the world of work and how it relates to the world of, of school, and I think that's what is so beautiful to see is the more that I think we all we are starting to work earlier and earlier and earlier, um, and I think that's one thing. The other thing is I personally am really my dream is just that this chaos go on for about another ten years, because I whenever someone says so we're going to decide about credentialing or you know oh yes it really should be tidied up. You know, remembering the early internet days that I was lucky enough to be a part of, you don't want to tidy it up too soon. You know, you want all these great experiments to run their course. Um, and you really want a long period of building a solid ecosystem. It's such a huge ecosystem that has to get built. I mean, it has to start in kindergarten. Mm -hmm. I, I never thought that before, but it really has to start in kindergarten. They have to see that being an engineer could be so cool, you know, or that being, or that they're going to grow up and have no idea really what they're going to be, but that everything they're learning relates to the world of contributing. And it's going to take, you know, it's going to take 20 years to really complete this revolution. Uh, Rachel? Sure. Uh, I think for us, it's a lot about thinking about how to support students as they move. And so we're in a new ecosystem mm -hmm. where the average student in America has attended multiple colleges oh, wow. before ever receiving a BA, if they do. The average 26-year-old in the U.S. has now had somewhere between five and seven employers. And we haven't built a system that helps them think through how they're accumulating their learning. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I agree with everything Jacqueline said around the secondary system. And then it only gets worse after you turn 18. And so the students we work with have earned so many of these quote unquote badges or credentials or employer sanctioned programs as well as community college credit and others but they have no idea how to think through what did that add up to and where does that take me and so I think what we spend most of our time thinking about is how do you help those students stack those opportunities onto each other to create meaningful credentials for them meaningful credentials for their employers and then meaningful opportunities for them beyond the employer they're at today, knowing that they're likely to move on through other careers and through other employers and we want to validate those learning opportunities and those skills. So, so this brings me, and I'll start with you, Jim, to, to another question and that is, and, and we've certainly bantered around with these words here, um, credentials, um, competencies, and then signaling communicating who you are and what you know uh, to employers. And we heard about, you know, for example, the Hyatt example at lunch where they basically throw everything out and just try and figure it out interpersonally. So Jim, how would you deal with that, especially if we move to this much more amorphous, porous educational ecosystem where people are accumulating all of these bits and pieces of, of knowledge along the way? I, I think that is the, the, the biggest challenge that everyone's facing right now, right? And I agree with a lot of what everyone said here, and Jacqueline in particular. Um, the on and off ramps of learning need to be constant and continuous, right? There needs to be many paths on, many paths off, many opportunities to actually be in the cycle of learning all the time. It's really at the core of what we do is this agile mindset, this agile thinking, that you have to be, you have to learn how to learn. Mm -hmm. And, and there has to be making that accessible, accessible and taking the risk away 
is important. But the complement to that is if you have the skills, the other thing you have to have is access. Because you can be the most brilliant autodidact in the world, teaching yourself in the library or on Khan Academy, et cetera. If someone can't open a door for you, or you, you're still going to be, you're still going to be stuck. But let's face it, we ha we're in a world of massive confusion of what does all these things mean? What does a, a you know a completion certificate from Udacity mean, or a Nano cert, or or this cert, or that cert, or it, it doesn't, it's, you know, the, the, it's becoming very, very challenging. I break the world into, into three pieces right now. Um, I, the learner's journey for me or the student life cycle, I, I call it the learner's journey because it's not just about being a student, but there's a phase of curiosity that needs to be fostered very, very early, right, where we should have the opportunity to find our vocation. The problem is, is a lot of that doesn't happen anymore. We've taken that out of the system because many of us are taught to just do school, right? You're just chasing the credential and not chasing meaningful work experience. It's not what is what leads to the, a lot of the people that we re-educate is what I call the unhappily employed. You know, there's unemployed, underemployed in a massive category of unhappily employed. That's most of our uh, base as student switchers that have followed, that did school, they did the AP courses, they got into the best school, they got some amazing degree and they're like, and they end up in one of four fields, right? They're in finance, medical, legal, or consulting and they're like, holy shit, my life sucks. I'm not happy, right? So we don't have time letting people explore risk-free, whether they're doing that online or other opportunities. So I do think we're gonna have a massively autonomized, unbundled system. And right now we're in that massive disruption where we don't know where it's gonna go. We have MOOCs and online and all these fractional players and we don't know what signals what. And if you look at how we've approached that, we pretty much have rebundled our own fully packed experience yeah. to understand and own the experience, not just from the student life cycle, but being able to take them, give them the skills, and actually place them in, in, in employment, at least their first employment yeah. opportunity. But, but it's as much educating the student graduate cert holder about how to signal her credentials as it is educating the employers to look differently. It's, I think, uh, you know, I spent a lot of time with Megan Smith in terms of inclusion, the CTO of uh, the United States, and we have massive inclusion efforts. We work with some of the biggest employers in the world to give uh, underrepresented groups and minorities access to this type of upward mobility. And as I talk to in terms of a system thinking way, I mean, what, how many job employers out there and I sat in a round table with the head of Uber, the head of Pinterest, the head of Nielsen, you know, with Megan, and said, how many of out there have your job requirements that a bachelor's degree is still required, right? And, and if you read Lazo Black's book, Rook Rules, a very data-driven company around their best talent, those that did school and followed the Ivy League cookie cutter are not the most successful employees at great companies like Google. But systematic thinking, we're building um, and if you read uh, Michael Crow's new book, The New American University, they quote over and over early, I forget the other author, one of our, the most perpetuating systems of divide in this country is the privileged system of higher academia that doesn't allow inclusion of underrepresented groups. And many, many underrepresented communities, if you can't see it, you can't be it. They don't even know it's an option. And that's a huge challenge in this country. Jacqueline, you wanna? Sure, thanks. And William DeBars is the co-author. Thanks yeah, for mentioning William, that book. Right, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, one thought that I just had, I'm thinking about my own experience hiring in my office, and I actually ask people to explain their resume to me, because I think this idea of chasing credentials or people thinking that their credential uh, speaks for itself. And so you can, have, you can have a certain GPA, you can have a variety of accolades on your resume, but I actually think the higher order of thinking is when individuals can explain why they made those choices to pursue those programs, what happened as a result, really what's the thread that, that brings it all together. And in thinking about how employers are going to go through a mind shift, the, the Markle Foundation is also interested in rethinking how employers make hiring decisions and they are beginning to look for employers that want to join that conversation and move beyond the credential and think more about competency. But again, as we heard, I believe it was earlier today, uh, at, at the root of thinking about competency will really end up being assessment. So there will be assessment of particular, we can say, hard skills and potentially assessments that um, also look at uh, non-cognitive or, or soft skills. But I think that there's some other category which is actually the, the learner's own understanding of their narrative. Um, and I'm thinking also about um, Gallup has this strengths finder assessment and uh, one of the skills that's noted that you can identify if it's in your top five skills is actually learner. And so I'm thinking about whether, and I thought it was interesting, you know, isn't it interesting that not everyone has the learner strength? And I would 
like to see a world in which we actually help everyone at a baseline have the learner strengths. And then they can also begin to work on uh, some of those other strengths so that employers, part of what they will actually be assessing, in addition to the competencies that are necessary to survive in the job on the day to day, is the extent to which they have a learner strength. And I think part of uh, the measurement of that, of, of whether or not someone has a learner strength, is if they can articulate the learning choices that they've made and the learning choices that they want to continue to make. And I think the way that we can begin to push this is um, starting to set new norms in terms of um, how we set screens in the first stages of interviews, um, how we actually um, interact with employees, how we discuss the benefits that employees earn, and whether lifelong learning become, and if lifelong learning can become an expected benefit. Um, then we begin to really shift the conversation. Uh, let me move to another question. And uh, we attached some slides to this session on your app, and you can look at them later. But uh, I'll, I'll deliberately challenge, and, and those data basically show the traditional slicing of educational credentials against earnings and against unemployment. And the data show with a few exceptions, that the higher the education is, the more you earn and the lower the unemployment. And even in the certificate, there's a table there about certificates or two years associate and so forth, looking at the delta or the change in earnings uh, with the exception of healthcare uh, certificates. Uh, and these are National Bureau of Economic Research studies or, I mean, they're um, big studies. That, um, that, that those data are not convincing. How would you respond to that? Well, I mean, I, I think one thing we now realize is that that's bundling a lot of things that need to be unpacked. So uh, to some extent, you know, kids who make it through four years, it is, it is a display of persistence, but it also in some way measures uh, perhaps how much social equity kids have grown up with uh, from their families that they're carrying through. So it's just like the joke about Harvard Business School, you know, is that they could take those kids and, you know, send them to the beach for two years and, you know, go be successful because they came in with a fair, fairly high level of skills. Um, so, I, I mean, I think that we have to just start unpacking. I, I look at that data. It's interesting to me that it's still holding up as well as it is. What's not true anymore is if you talk to the employers hiring now, they will tell you, Airbnb, Google, Chase, I mean, it doesn't really matter who. They'll say, we're not going to hire that way anymore. <coughs> I mean, we still do, but we know that we shouldn't be hiring that way anymore because we know that it is not telling us who is the best employee and who is going to be best in teams and who is going to be more promotable and who is going to stay with us. They all know it. I think now it's just a matter of the execution, of what to do about that knowledge. But that knowledge is definitely out there on the, on the, on the sort of demand side of the equation. Rachel. Uh, so for us, we know our students, the best path for them from any low wage job that they might have across the 10 or so industries that we know of, the best path into the middle class for them is a promotion into a managerial or supervisory role. And something that's very counter in today's economy is that the average 30-year-old with an HBS degree, uh, only about 50% of them manage right out yes. of their first job, whereas nearly yeah. every 22 to 24-year-old in a low-wage economy will have an opportunity to manage or supervise within six months of good performance on the job. And that's a really fast path to the middle class. And it's not terminal, and that's why we often talk about college degrees beyond that. Um, but where we think that data gets a little lost is that data is always cut by industry. And managerial and supervisory roles are across industries, and it gets lost there. And uh, Tony Carnavali's yeah. written a bit about this. And so for us, we respect that data and know where it lives within industries but um, you know, the value of a bachelor's degree, if you are skilled in a technical skill, the thing holding you back from that managerial and supervisory role are often soft skills and a lot of the social equity that often can be developed yes. in upper income families that often isn't provided to our students. Right. And we don't think they always need to go back to college to get that. Yeah, and, and, and I, I don't mean to be the challenger here, but I think the other, uh, it's not just that these data are so aggregated that they're not fine-tuned. It's also that you're unclear on whether these certificate programs, et cetera, are in lieu of or in addition to other right. forms of education. Yeah. 
And I, and I think none of what you're saying, and in fact, Jim, you were saying that your unhappily employed person is one of your favorite <laughs> customers in your programs. Let me ask one more question and then maybe turn it over to the audience. Uh, I, I, I think the almost dominant theme here at, at this conference, and, and thank you, ASU and GSP, for the conference, um, has been that education has to be the tool that challenges and transforms the societal uh, uh, divide in our country, and frankly, all over the world, that bridges the gap between those that have grown up in underserved environments uh, to those who will have opportunity. So how are each of your enterprises, each of your programs addressing that bridge between the um, economic divide? Candace. I mean, that's such an exciting question because we didn't even know how to get someone ready to work, and so we started with already really smart, successful kids, which is kind of what Jim is also working with, a lot of the boot camps work with. But then once we figured out that you could, within about a month, get someone from being like a kind of a scruffy college student from almost any income level, almost any background, to being a pretty badass contributor to an entry level job. We got really excited about how this could totally un unsettle, you know, the hierarchy within higher ed pretty quickly because we see community college students that actually, um, we, we see their level of readiness just climb in such a short amount of time. And now it's written down on the piece of paper is not where they went to school, but what they know how to do. And they know how to talk about what they know how to do and they know how to engage the employer. So. I've gotten really excited about how quickly, not only in this country, but in a lot of other countries, this could actually finally be the thing that does start to break down this really rigid hierarchy of tiers of education. So in terms of making education more accessible, the project that I was just discussing is making the educational opportunities more transparent, addressing information gaps. But of course, there are a variety of other barriers that individuals face when they're trying to access an education, whether it be financial, whether it be social, whether it be relational in terms of fitting it into their life. And ASU is working across all fronts. And when President Crow uh, came to ASU, he made it a priority to measure our success as a university based on who we include, how they succeed, not based on who we exclude. And so uh, there are a variety of um, ways, as I said, that we're working to do this, whether it be creating more on-ramps through things like the Global Freshman Academy, whether it be working with Starbucks so that all Starbucks partners can access a college degree through ASU online, whether it be dramatically increasing our engineering college uh, to make sure that underrepresented groups are now graduating as, as engineers. Um, and really, it all boils down to making this accessibility um, mission a part of who we are and just a part of our everyday uh, experience at ASU. It's why I joined ASU, um, and I um, think that actually technology has played a major role in enabling us to deliver more opportunities to more groups. Jim? Um, it's, it was the very core of what we do. We believe that anyone with ambition and aptitude should have an opportunity and, and contrary to a lot of uh, our competitors in the boot camp space, we run the lar longest program, right? It's twice as long as the longest program and from the very beginning we built gender paired uh, uh, programs. We had 50% male and 50% female. It doesn't always work out that way as we open new markets in terms of the applicant pool. Um, but our mission is to give anybody an option and path. And we've taken young women on unemployment with high school diplomas only. And we've had women in their late 50s who are trying to re-enter the workforce. We have folks that are coming with their very last dollar and coming to our program. We've worked with Atlassian, IBM, and Google and given over a million dollars in inclusion and scholarships. Um, we're working at the highest levels of the U.S. government to help with this, and we're working at the highest levels of the U.S. Department of Education to solve the inclusion uh, challenge to make, make this type of program more accessible. We really have done the hard work of helping transform lives, and um, we were just had a luncheon with uh, Congresswoman Diana DeGette the other day, and I had a grown man uh, crying at lunch talking about how we changed his life and being able to give him, 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 him access to um, a whole new world by, I mean, these young women on unemployment with high school diplomas only are making $80,000, right? That is life-changing forever. And that, when you're transforming people's lives, there's nothing more rewarding, but that is literally at the core of, of what we do. 
Rachel. Uh, yeah, we, I agree with lots of the things you've all said about what changes. I think to add a little additional color, um, you know, there's a lot of talk this week about unbundling and about offering more content and more opportunity. And we find that many of our students have access to as much content as their upper income peers. Um, but we believe that the core of fixing some of the economic divide comes down to support and student support. So as our students have access to more and more content and more and more opportunities, the thing that often holds them back is access to advice and navigating that path. And so for us, um, we think a lot about the statistic that shows that one of the key indicators of whether someone will succeed in any higher ed program is the cell phone number of a mentor. And so all of our students have a coach, and we think that's a, a backbone of what we have to do on issues related to the economic divide, especially as content becomes more and more accessible and commoditized, figuring out how to provide them the uh, advice to navigate the path. Thank you. We have five minutes. <laughs> Questions, please. I'm interested in your thoughts or comments that Ted Mitchell said this afternoon about his number one priority is closing that completion gap for higher education, which is at 60 percent. And just curious on what your thoughts, comments, and feelings are on that point. Completion. So I'll jump in. So as you might imagine, uh, at a university, we think about completion every day. Uh, one technology-enabled um, solution that we're working to help students get on the right path is eAdvisor. And so, so often students can waste precious time in their early years trying to figure out their major, taking courses that are getting them off track. And so we've really prioritized on-time graduation, and it starts really with the academic advising, which is offered in person. You can develop a relationship with someone who will support you over the course of your bachelor's degree, but is technology-enhanced in that um, you can explore the variety of majors that you might pursue and have a good understanding of how you might persist. Also important to mention is our relationship with the Maricopa Community College System, the largest in the country. Uh, so many, uh, the majority of people in college are actually in community colleges, and so we've made it a priority to help with the transition from the associates. And even if you don't complete the associates, if you take some courses at the community college and then want to transfer to ASU, we've actually mapped all of the courses so that a student who's taking English 101 at a community college, it seems very basic, but across the country this is not the case, that these community college courses that have similar prefixes do not always map on to the four-year. Um, so I would say one way to move towards completion has to actually do with helping students navigate their pathway and also making efficiency changes so that students' precious time is respected. Jim, do you want to comment on Yeah, on we don't. Uh, it's not a challenge for us. So, I mean, we're, uh, we're not in competition with, with, yeah, with exactly. higher ed and we're not a... Yeah. I mean, people come to us, they're completing. I mean, it's not even, it's a non-issue for us. It's not even applicable. The only time someone doesn't complete is some exogenous event of a ill or tragedy or some, some random event. So it's a little bit different. Kind of plus by the difference between ASU, great institution, and then the whole, you know, 100% completion rate within the um, we're, we're, I, I wouldn't think of us as, we're not dueling products at yeah. all, right? We're not. Yeah. Um, Anybody that can afford and have time to go through a, a great humanities uh, education, they should, right? We're, I like to classify us as that last mile of skills and connection to employment, right? And we're particularly a tech-enabled company, right? We're a very specific and very technical data science and software engineering and web development mobile skill sets that are complement to helping develop the full person, which, I mean, we're not capable of taking somebody right out of high school, right? We're not, they're not socially, emotionally capable. We have had a handful of high school students come to our program, but that aperture is not, not for us. We're not capable of doing that. We're not going to build dorms and we're not going to build humanities programs. I do think a lot of that learning should happen much, much earlier. I personally have three young kids, my oldest going into middle school, and they've gone to very non-traditional Montessori programs and, and I take them on crazy trips and expose them to lots of things and amazing, powerful women. I'm raising two daughters in addition to a son. So I too want to show them that there's amazing opportunities they can do anything. But we're, I mean, we haven't formalized some work, but we are, you know, we are opening a campus in Phoenix this fall and we've been talking lots with Jacqueline and Michael's team and we're going to do some really unique work with employers in the region to, to collaborate with them and they have one of the largest computer science schools in the world. Um, and we can help connect them with employers and give them very specific niche skills that, that you know, are, is a great complement to what they do. Let me try to get one more question in. Any other? 
Okay, yes. Sorry. Uh, Kevin Greer from, sorry, Kevin Greer from New Profit. Um, a few of you have talked about uh, what you call soft skills and how you develop those and assess those. I'm curious the folks that are involved in doing that in various ways, if you could just talk a little bit more about both how you develop them and how you think about assessing them. It's something that we're very interested in uh, just, thinking more about. I mean, I think what we have found is there are two levels of soft skills. So, uh, you know, one would think that, so if we consider like finance and even design thinking, if those are hard skills for a general um, entry level person, there's teamwork, there's, um, you know, time management, project management. We would think of those to some degree as soft skills. But then we discovered another level, which is more in the, I guess, the quality of traits, which has to do with, you know, giving your knowledge away quickly, helping other team members, um, having a positive attitude. It turns out employers value those things a lot, persistence. I think that we've gotten to the point where we can do uh, really a good observation and assessing of the soft skills, the first set of soft skills, because we've been working on that for quite a long time. What I think we're now playing around with is how do you move, how do you nudge these traits forward, actually? Um, and that's kind of level we're interested in now. But I think in order to really observe soft skills, I think, and assess them, you need to see people operating with others, which is why for us the team structure is core to everything that we do and believe in. If you do not see, you know, if you see them operating solo, you just simply cannot get really a lot of information about their soft skills. And then I think just having good rubrics so that you can begin to assess them is the other thing that we found. I uh, agreed with the vast majority of what you said. Um, one other perspective is we went and spoke with 60 employers about what soft skills they were looking for to move someone from an entry level role right into that managerial or supervisory. And we kept hearing the same things across so many industries. And then when we went and looked at curriculums, we found it was all in the uh, elite higher ed business school curriculums at places like Harvard and Stanford. And yet that has been entirely locked up in ivory towers and not given to our student population who's often at a different u university or institution. So what we teach looks pretty similar. Uh, it's case study driven. It involves a lot of role play and interaction. And it's pretty focused on how do you manage others. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, panel. Thank you.